I've got a great pleasure of introducing our first keynote speaker, Professor James Sheptiki. James is a professor of criminology at York University in Toronto, Canada. He received his PhD in sociology from the London School of Economics in 1991 and was an ESCR, postdoctoral research fellow in the Centre for Criminology and the Social and Philosophical Study of Law at the University of Edinburgh in 1993 to 1999. So, so what is this ESCR? Well, my research indicates that the ESCR is either the European Society for Cardiac Research or the International Network for Economic, Cultural and Social Rights. So let's assume it's the latter, James, uh, which clearly is much more relevant to the theme of this conference. Uh, James' principal research interests centre on policing and crime under conditions of transnationalisation. He is the author, co-author, or editor of several books, including uh, Issues in Transnational Policing, In Search of Transnational Policing Towards a Sociological, uh, the Sociology of Global Policing, Transnational and Comparative Criminology, Crafting Transnational Policing, Transnational Crime and Policing, Global Policing, and a book published in French, the title of which I lack the courage to articulate. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming the first of our keynote speakers, Professor James Sheptiki, who will speak on the topic Global Policing and Human Rights. Thank you very much, John. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'd like to uh, thank the conference organizers, Simon, and the, all the hardworking people at SEPS for organizing this event. It's a, it's a real honor to uh, be here to present today. All right. Good. Uh, the presentation that I'm going to give today is, is drawn extensively from a book that I produced with my friend and colleague Ben Bowling. Uh, it was published in 2012. The book is called Global Policing. Um, in that book, our task was to make global policing theoretically visible. Global policing is a complex inter- institutional concatenation of many organizations. There's no global police headquarters. It's not like uh, the old days uh, of police research when you could uh, go to the police headquarters in the city that you lived in and knock on the door and politely ask for access. And of course, it would be forthcoming. Uh, why not invite academics in to uh, investigate the secret social world of policing, it was that easy. Uh, no, there is no global police headquarters and, and our task um, was to try and make this phenomenon theoretically visible. I don't have a lot to say about human rights today. I'm going to leave that task to others and I don't know that I'm the warm-up act for David Bailey so I'm pretty sure he'll do a good job of that. Uh, but what I want to do is, is give you some theoretical tools, some concepts, uh, an abstract language for talking about the patterns of practice in, in global policing and to understand this inter-institutional concatenation of organizations that make up the secret social world of, of global policing. And the question that I want to ask to try and give my um, presentation today some overall coherence is, can policing under transnational conditions give rise to a constabulary ethic? What is good policing under conditions of transnationalization? What would that look like? And further, what do the practices of transnational policing actually look like? And can they give rise to something like good policing? Um, the uh, images that I've chosen to illustrate this slide uh, get at a number of points, I think. Uh, one of them is about social exclusion and the enforcement of social exclusion. We live in a world of haves and have-nots. 
Uh, everywhere you look around the world, it doesn't matter which jurisdiction you are in, even the lucky country has have-nots who endure a life uh, of being able to envision plenty on nightly television, and they're acutely aware of their exclusion in this world, and they're acutely aware of the processes of enforcement that keep them socially, economically, politically, culturally excluded. <clears throat> Good policing, at very least, is about lifting people up into a condition of overall civilization, about community capacity building, about a due regard for human rights. It's not about uh, enforcing exclusion, it's about global justice. Of course, under conditions of transnationalization, we're enduring a period of rapid historical, social, cultural, political, economic change. In a globalizing world, we are all suffering from feelings of ontological insecurity. And for good reasons, thinking about what we're likely to read in the newspaper on any given day, stories about food insecurity, water insecurity, ecological breakdown, overpopulation, the rush of immigrants on the boats to get to the lucky country, economic dislocation. There are good reasons for um, this ontological insecurity. And when we feel insecure, when we feel fear, there is a tendency to uh, react in an emotional way. Well, what my talk won't do today is spell out uh, in precise terms what a constabulary ethic would look like, the specific principles of it. What I want to do instead is show why it is necessary for people, people like us, people in our line of work, people who feel our calling, uh, to take a notion like the constabulary ethic seriously. As it happens, this concept, the constabulary ethic, is not my own. I didn't make it up. I wasn't sitting in my armchair reading a book. Uh, uh, just poof, it came to me uh, as if from the heavens. The constabulary ethic is a, is a concept that arose in the context of UN peacekeeping missions, specifically Canadian soldiers enforcing the blue line in Cyprus. And what Canadian soldiers have realized over a long history of peacekeeping is that they're not quite trained to do the job. They're trained for the killing job. They're trained to occupy. They're trained to do battle. And what they're asked to do in peacekeeping missions is something rather different than that. They're asked to keep the peace. They're asked to think in a different way. And so it was in the context of these military peacekeeping operations that people first began to think about the constabulary ethic. And I think that that's a kind of interesting uh, starting point in the historical genealogy of um, this concept. It's also, uh, I think, acutely interesting because we know from our reading of the development of the history of modern police that the police institution, these organizations that keep order in our cities and countries, were um, initially hived off from the military institution. Um, I'm not teaching anybody in this room anything, least of all David Bailey. I recall being a graduate student many years ago reading some of his work uh, outlining the historical development of the modern police institution in Europe and how it was hived off from the, from the military institution. Now, the images that I've chosen to illustrate this slide are deliberately chosen. They're uh, images about military and police peacekeeping. In the lower right-hand corner, you'll see a picture of an Australian soldier, an Aussie soldier. Uh, he's <clears throat> stationed in East Timor, and you'll see in his right hand he has uh, a number of machetes. Uh, what those uh, personnel were doing there uh, part of the time was de-weaponizing 
de-weaponizing the local population, taking away um, the weapons of mass destruction, uh, and trying to instill conditions of uh, peace, order, and good government. Uh, the point of this image is to say that sometimes policing, even policing that is guided by principles like the constabulary ethic, still requires the use of force. Um, the theory that I propound is not an idealistic one, what if the world was all nice and lovely and la la la, and we all got along. No, policing is um, 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 a reality of, of uh, the social world, and the use of force uh, remains uh, an ever-present uh, aspect of the mission. <clears throat> Just uh, try and remind you about the genealogy of the word policing. What is the word policing? What is policing? It's a part of a family of words, uh, which includes other concepts like politics, policy, polity. It emerges from an ancient Greek word, polis, and it means something like, in its initial formulation, the governance of cities. Um, <clears throat> it pertains to authoritative intervention into situational exigencies which cannot always be predicted in advance. Things go wrong, and sometimes you need people to say, stand back from the fire trucks, folks. The firefighters need to do their job. I know you want to take pictures, but if you get in the way, we're going to push you back. Use of force. Um, <clears throat> but policing is constrained by an idea, the minimal use of force. You don't shoot the people because they want to take pictures of the firefighters. You use minimal force to get them out of the way. Policing aims to preserve social order. And there's an important distinction to be made. Is it social order in the general interests? Or is it a social order in the specific interests of particular uh, groups within the society? Policing is not mere law enforcement. It's concerned broadly with the health of the social body, maintaining conditions of good social order. And democratic policing is undertaken on behalf of a citizenry with which both understand and endorse the mission. They're part of policing. And police are, under this conception, mere citizens in uniform. We're all in this together. Under transnational conditions, this is especially tricky because we're balancing the needs for the global commonwealth. We're all in this together, all of us, all eight billion, with local traditions of order. And so global policing, such as it is, has a, a very complex set of balancing acts to fulfill. The choice is either we have um, uh, the police as a citizen in uniform actively promoting uh, the general social order or um, something a little bit um, less friendly, I suppose. This, um, this slide is an attempt to uh, conceptually map the field of policing. Uh, I, We'll take a few minutes to go through this table so that you can understand um, what's going on here. My uh, friend and colleague Jean-Paul Brodier years ago uh, brought into our language for studying policing an uh, important and clear distinction between high policing and low policing, the policing of particular social interests and the policing of general social interests the policing of politics and the policing of uh, <clears throat> the street. This high policing, low policing distinction is um, a, a, a tricky one, uh, but it is nevertheless an important one. We also know in our contemporary period that all policing is not 
conducted under the auspices of state governmental organizations. A significant amount of policing is carried out under private auspices, and this distinction between public and private policing, and I see Philip standing at the back of the room, one of the key scholars in developing the sociology of, of private security, um, and I'm, I'm sure that he um, would um, emphasize this, this distinction. I like to make a third analytical distinction. The, policing, uh, the distinction between policing of territory and the policing of populations, of bodies, of individuals. And I know that this analytical distinction is, is a bit of a slippery one. Um, but in the new uh, world of intelligence-led policing, uh, we can see a manifestation of this distinction, territory and populations. Some intelligence-led policing operations aim at policing hotspots, territories of urban space, which uh, have given indicators of being insecure, risky, and so forth. Other intelligence led policing operations are against core nominals, individuals who are deemed to be threatening and risky and so forth. So we can see uh, in the practices of contemporary professional policing this concern to police territory and the concern to police individuals, to police bodies. And obviously you cannot control territory unless you control the individuals that are uh, on the territory, and you can't control the individuals on the territory unless you have some purchase on that space. So it's, in practice, intermingled. But I think it's an analytical distinction that's worth making because it, it makes us think more subtly about this, this um, whole field of um, um, uh, policing practice. So we have the distinction between high and low, public and private, territorial and population policing. Uh, <clears throat> I could go on. Uh, I, I, I read in the newspaper when I was here uh, not so long ago that uh, there's an organization in Australia called the Australian Security Intelligence Organization. Uh, th that institution aims at patrolling the domestic territory of Australia, and it provides human intelligence about the bodies who inhabit that territory. So that's one way of making this territory population distinction uh, work for us, and it's clearly a matter of high policing. Uh, there's another organization in Australia called the Australian Secret Intelligence Service. Now, the Australian Secret Intelligence Service is concerned with overseas espionage and high policing, and they collect human intelligence on territories out with Australia. Now, these two organizations have come into the news recently because um, I understand um, some people want to harmonize the legal frame within which these heretofore uh, separate organizations have operated uh, so that um, more joint, joint working is, uh, is possible and this has raised some eyebrows in the uh, civil liberties, uh, in the world of civil liberties uh, campaigners. I don't know too much about it uh, other than to say that this is a, a, a way in which this conceptual field does some work for us. We, uh, our, our theories would be incomplete without being able to talk about the distinction between high and low policing and being able to draw in uh, organizations uh, at, at, at either level. Um, I know that the, uh, I read that the Australian Secret Intelligence Service uh, got itself into a spot of trouble back in 1997. Uh, Andrew Goldsmith might, might know more about this than I do. Uh, a, 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 an organization called Sandline International got involved in Papua New Guinea uh, in some distinctly dodgy operations. And uh, people felt at the time that the Australian Secret Intelligence Service ought to have known ahead of time that this private military uh, outfit, a private 
police, private security organization working for the particular interests of individuals in PNG uh, was about to uh, try and uh, ful essentially fulminate a coup. So here we have an example, uh, I think with Sandline International, of a kind of organization which is uh, classifiable as a high security uh, type organization, but of a private, uh, private um, nature. I'm just working here to give you a sense of how this conceptual field uh, can be used to do some theoretical, theoretical uh, work for us. Good. Well, clearly the uh, conceptual field is uh, complex and the empirical ra reality that it's attempting to um, uh, uh, conceptualize is is um, is equally complicated. It is, as I said at the outset, a complex concatenation of inter-institutional connections and rivalries. It's a fantastically complex array of uh, institutions. But when we patrol the newspapers and look at uh, the late night news broadcast, we see, a, I think, a kind of tendency to collapse all of this complexity into uh, one or other perspective. On the one hand, we have a kind of naive, liberal, international, legal institutionalism. If only we got the rules right, if only we got the accountability structures right, if only the uh, organizations of the International Criminal Court and so forth were, were working uh, correctly, we would uh, be living in a, in a human rights utopia. This is what I would describe as a naive, liberal, international, legal institutionalism. Uh, on the flip side, we have a, dis a kind of view of a dystopian policing control complex. Uh, uh, the idea that global policing is somehow some massive conspiracy led by Big Brother. When, you, when one sees the complexity of reality um, collapsed into uh, a, a bivariate dis set of distinctions, easy twofold classification, you know you're on to something because our job is to make the complexity alive and understandable without, uh, without um, um, uh, recourse to simplistic uh, uh, good guys and bad guys imagery. Well, when it comes to global policing, this is precisely the kind of discourse that we hear about. Um, <clears throat> we hear a kind of functional explanation. Why do we have global policing emerging in the 21st century. What is its purpose? What is its meaning? Its meaning is, as this image on the top right-hand corner, our left-hand corner of the screen suggests, powerful crime groups are corrupting our communities. Uh, the justification for global policing is a functional one. It's predication on, predicated on the globalization of a variety of forms of global crime and insecurity. Complex crimes and con conspiracies are spanning the globe, and so we have to have international police collaboration to put them in their place. This is a functional explanation. It's an image of good guys and bad guys, white hats and black hats, the uh, at risk and the risky, the threatened and the threatened. It's a Manichaean worldview. Uh, and very often this Manichaean worldview is held aloft by military metaphors, uh, the metaphor of the thin blue line and so forth. And here I have a quote from um, <clears throat> the uh, New South Wales Attorney General Greg Smith recently uh, quoted in the Sydney Morning Herald, the police are our army against crime. This military martial metaphor. We're back to um, uh, the problem that, well, the military are trained for the killing job. And if we've defined good guys and bad guys, enemies and us, then surely our police are uh, up to the task. Our book, Global Policing, draws extensively on the literature concerning um, the subculture of policing. I, I 
really like the, uh, the tradition in the sociology of policing that focuses on the occupational subculture of policing, the meanings that give that secret social world its sense of self. Um, <clears throat> and here I want to talk about the possibility of a transnational subculture of policing, a notion that doesn't matter whether you're in Sydney, Nova Scotia, or Sydney, Australia, Mumbai, India, or Melbourne, Australia, that there's a commonality, a family of resemblance that unites all the obviously uniquely local subcultural traditions of policing, what I call a transnational subculture of policing. Now, the, uh, I think the key uh, thinker uh, when it comes to formulating an understanding of, uh, or a key thinker, has got to be Egon Bittner and his, his wonderful book, The Functions of Policing in Modern Society. And he, he uh, highlights a, a, a range of focal concerns for what he was studying, the, the, uh, the subculture of uh, policing in, in big American cities. And he, he talks about clannishness, rule enforcing, uh, enforcement, uh, law enforcement, uh, the discre discretionary uh, use of, uh, of uh, uh, force, uh, uh, the felt duty to intervene in situations that, quote unquote, not, ought not to be happening and about which something must be done now. Uh, they're, feelings of social isolation uh, hiding behind the thin blue line, their loyalty to the group, their suspicion, and the, uh, the felt need to maintain secrecy. And of course, this is what makes doing policing research rather difficult, the suspicion and secrecy. I'm just a civilian. I'm a funny guy, and I don't really belong to the club. It's difficult to do police research, research given the clannishness of the police subculture. There are other parameters, I think, that are important to understand in the, in the, uh, to the contemporary subculture of policing. The technological uh, ways and means, the managerial regimes in which they work, the policing by numbers, the bean counting, all of these things shape uh, policing subculture in important ways. The legal tools that they have at their uh, disposal, the political regime in which policing is manifested changes from place to place and time to time. Above all, there's always the felt need to get something done. I have a, an image to illustrate this slide. Uh, this is a picture, I think, of a Los Angeles County Sheriff uh, officer, and he's there with a gangster. The gangster's showing his tummy, and uh, <clears throat> on his chest is tattooed. I don't know if you can read it. It says, fuck the police. Fuck the police. Policing is uh, depicted here as an occupational subculture set up in opposition to a dangerous class, suitable enemies, folk devils. And here we have white hats, black hats, good guys, bad guys, the at risk, the risky. This is, I think, the, uh, the, the key trope which gives meaning to something like a concept, uh, the transnational subculture of policing, the thin blue line. Now, in our book, Global Policing, we also like to talk about uh, the subculture of transnational policing. And here we have a quote from Robert Reiner, uh, and he talks about uh, <clears throat> a convergence around the world of police organizations around fundamentally similar organizational and cultural lines. And he says that the bearers of this transformation around the world are what he calls a new international of technocratic police experts who are responsible for diffusions in fashions of police thinking around the globe. <clears throat> I think this uh, recognition of this police intelligentsia, this, the bearers of this subculture of transnational policing is absolutely key to those of us who are interested in 
fostering a constabulary ethic, fostering human rights-based policing. Because if we can convince uh, ourselves, as members of this police intelligentsia, uh, that uh, a, something like a constabulary ethic is, is worthwhile, uh, then that will become part and parcel of the fads and fashions that are circulated within the subcultural world of policing around the globe. So it's, it's, with, a, it's a, with a view, I think, to influencing uh, the police liaison officers and other entrepreneurs who are um, uh, taking uh, the subculture of transnational policing global um, that uh, I, I would like to introduce uh, this language of the constabulary ethic. Unfortunately, there are many pressures that prevail against this project. And I'm just going to mention three today. The first is the obvious tendency towards the paramilitarization of policing. Uh, here on this slide I have a, a number of uh, images. These uh, images are um, showing the, the kind of ramping up of the weaponization of policing, a variety of um, new tools to uh, enact the use of force are uh, being sold around the world um, to to the police. I got pictures of shotgun tasers and and um, the active denial system and so forth. These tools are elements in the material culture of policing, and they encode a certain type of meaning, a kind of meaning that valorizes the use of force, that valorizes violence. It, elevates the use of force to the number one position in the subcultural world of policing. It makes that characterological type that we all know so well from the subcultural literature, what William Kerr Murr Jr. labeled the enforcer, the center stage actor in the secret social world of uh, the police subculture. So this paramilitarization, this tendency uh, to uh, make policing more and more like military occupation runs quite counter to uh, an ethic of the constabulary. Uh, another trend in contemporary techno-policing is uh, around the uh, emergence of the surveillance assemblage, the vast array of surveillance information and communications technologies which knitted together give uh, us controllers the panoptic promise, the promise that panoptic surveillance will give us social control, total social control, and here I'm drawing on the ideas of Michel Foucault. It wasn't so long ago in the United States that they were talking about a system of total information awareness that um, the, the surveillance assemblage could be uh, made so efficient that um, the control uh, agencies would have total information awareness. And here we see, with, embedded within the uh, surveillance assemblage, again, this ability, this uh, promise to sort the risky from the at risk, the threatening from the threatened, the good guys from the bad guys, the de deserving and undeserving, this bifurcation of, of the social world into us and them. Of course, um, the surveillance assemblage is a, a double-edged phenomenon. It, it, it isn't all working for uh, uh, at the behest of Big Brother. This isn't a conspiracy theory that I'm talking about. Um, uh, synoptic power is the other edge of um, the surveillance assemblage, and I wish I had a photograph uh, to illustrate this point. Um, but police officers doing uh, large-scale public order uh, operations are well aware of the possibility that they can be photographed with a camera phone, that their uh, undue use of force can be uh, captured by surveillance and that um, bad things can happen. So surveillance power is, is double-edged. It's uh, uh, so the phenomenon that we're trying to describe, global policing, is, is, is not all one way. <clears throat> the territories that comprise the global system are being carved up into uh, zones of variable risk. 
Uh, there's tactics and techniques of risk suppression. Uh, the the uh, diagram on the top left here is a classic one, one of the most famous diagrams, I think, in, in uh, the criminological literature. This is uh, uh, the diagram produced by the famous Chicago School of Criminology in the 1920s. It, it purports to depict uh, the, the zonal development of the city of Chicago. Um, <clears throat> In the contemporary period, that image of the city, the Chicago School's image of the city, has been replaced by uh, Mike Davis's vision of the city of courts, which separates, again, the risky from the at-risk, the threatened from the threatening, the good guys from the bad guys, the deserving from the undeserving, the rich from the poor. And those divisions, says Mike Davis and others, have to be enforced. Not so long ago, a couple days ago, I was wandering along uh, the South Bank in Brisbane with a friend of mine, Alice uh, Baroni, who studies uh, police um, uh, suppression tactics in the city of Sao Paulo in her country where she lives in Brazil. Uh, currently, in, 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 uh, in the build-up to the Olympics there, police units are going into the favelas in Sao Paulo, and they are viciously suppressing um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the undeserving. They're viciously putting down the risky. They are viciously putting in their place the threatening. Uh, all in the name of producing a suitable social order for uh, the upcoming Olympics. Alice was telling me that she was just on her way back to Sao Paulo uh, from Brisbane and that the flight was going to take many, many hours. And some of us know uh, the, 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 the difficulties of negotiating that. But, she said, this is nothing in comparison to what I, awaits me when I get back to Sao Paulo because I arrive at 2 in the morning and it's only 7 kilometers to my apartment in downtown Sao Paulo, but I cannot cross the red line at night. The dangers of kidnapping, the dangers of being uh, waylaid by corrupt police officers are just too much. And so I'm going to have to sit in the airport for six or seven hours until daylight to cross the red line. So what I'm trying to illustrate here with, uh, for you is the sense that uh, the global social system is encoded uh, and, and broken down into these risk suppression zones, both at the very micro level and at, uh, uh, at the global level. And all of these boundaries that separate the risky from the at-risk have to be enforced. <clears throat> In the couple of minutes that are left to me, I just want to uh, wrap up for you. I think that these, uh, these countervailing uh, tendencies within contemporary policing discourse, the tendency towards paramilitarization, the lure of the panoptic power of the surveillance assemblage, the um, um, uh, obvious mapping of our um, territories and separation of, um, uh, uh, of, z uh, of zones of riskiness uh, uh, add up to what I call the security control paradox. And the security control paradox is this that the more our um, agents of social control promise us security through new legal tools, through new control tools, new surveillance devices, new uh, tools for use of force, the more they promise us security through uh, uh, these means, the less secure we feel. And anybody that's old enough to reflect back on international uh, air travel, uh, anybody that started flying internationally in the early 1970s has a real good sense of this. I remember getting on a Boeing 747s in 1973 and flying internationally. Going through airports was a breeze. The stewardess would welcome us onto the plane and uh, get a glass of champagne or orange juice. It was very nice. and. Certainly as a young boy, 13 years old, I never felt a sense of insecurity back in those days. Flash 
fast forward to our contemporary period 2013, where airport security has been ramped up to an intense degree. Do I feel more secure when I arrive at the international airport uh, waiting to get on my plane? No. My heart is thumping in my chest. I can feel the adrenaline pumping. Through. I'm not guilty. I'm a good guy. I'm a criminologist. And I feel insecure. The more the security uh, regime is ramped up in the promise of delivering us security, the less secure this is the security control paradox. And the way it works is something like this. The real social world gives rise to problems. And there are going to be needs. Policing is a real social need, even in the most idyllic surroundings. There's always going to be exigencies which need to be controlled. The crowd that wants to get in the way to get the good picture of uh, uh, the house blazing, they're in the way. The firefighters need to do their job, and so you need to have somebody whose responsibility it is to force them away. That's policing. And no social order is totally without these kinds of situational exigencies. This, um, it is the case. But our tendency is to give rise to a set of policing policies, practices, ways and means, meanings subculturally embedded and projected onto our general culture through mass media, generally accepted, policing ways and means that are in a sense, uh, incapable of answering uh, the, uh, the, the very real needs that are there in the first instance. They produce unintended side effects, unintended consequences, iatrogenic effects. Uh, they make matters worse. And so it reproduces the, uh, the problems and at a heightened level of anxiety. Trying to bring this all to a conclusion, and I, I appreciate that I've glossed over a great many things and that the, uh, the, the, the presentation that I'm giving you is operating at a very, very high level of abstraction and that many of you will have uh, detailed understanding, fine-grained understanding of situations, localities, issues, and problems uh, that uh, raise interesting questions. I do appreciate that. It seems to me, though, that uh, in a world that gives rise to a real need for policing, we have to um, think well about uh, what kind of policing uh, we want. Uh, do we want, uh, as the image of the, 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 the female police officer on the right-hand uh, edge of the, the, uh, the screen seems to indicate a thoughtful guided response, and as the woman in the top left-hand corner of the screen uh, seems to indicate, maybe sometimes forceful, or RoboCop, who hides his face and reaches for, uh, as the image in the bottom left-hand uh, corner of the screen suggests, uh, a weapon of uh, extreme forcefulness. And I'll just uh, note that my, uh, one of my competitors in the international world of the police intelligentsia speaking uh, about what is to be done when it comes to global policing, uh, Vladimir Putin speaking to Interpol uh, some years ago. I'm pretty sure he's not talking about a constabulary ethic. So we're talking about global policing, and it seems to me that uh, as, as, as real as the need is for a police response, sometimes forceful, always thoughtful, uh, a, 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 a guiding premise might be something like this. Good policing, the policing, uh, uh, the constabulary ethic is concerned with the process of civilization. And here I'm drawing on the work of the great German sociologist Norbert Elias. Civilization is a process in which one gradually increases the number of people included in the terms we or us, and at the same time decreases those labeled as you or them, until that category has no one left in it. 
So if, if the constabulary ethic means anything, it is uh, an attempt to abolish this separation of the risky from the at-risk, the threatening from the threatened, the deserving from the undeserving, the good guys from the bad guys, the white hats from the black hats, the insiders from the outsiders. It's about creating a global civilization. Thank you very much for your time.